Welcome to Corwin's Leaders Coaching Leaders Podcast with host Peter DeWitt. This podcast is from education leaders for education leaders. Every week, Peter and our guests get together to share ideas, put research into practice, and ensure every student is learning, not by chance, but by design. Hey, Peter. Hey, Tanya. How are you? I'm really good. Well, Today's, uh, I'm pretty excited about today's recording just because, well, a few reasons. One, it gave me the opportunity to actually spend a lot of time off air talking with him, but it, um, it's also just such an honor when I get the opportunity to have a conversation with John Hattie, who is our guest today. Many people are going to know that John is Professor Emeritus from the University of Melbourne in Australia. He's won numerous awards, you know, both state, country, worldwide. He's um, the most cited uh, educational researcher in the world. And um, he just released Visible Learning, the sequel, which is really exciting, um, which is something we actually, we talked about in the podcast as well. But uh, John, more than that, I feel very fortunate because he's also a friend and he's been a mentor of mine over the years. I've always felt honored that that I know him. and. Um, you know, the person, not just the researcher, but the person, uh, John Hattie, is a pretty spectacular guy. So this conversation was was really good. I should give people a heads up, though, that I was recording from uh, my hotel room in California because I was there for work. And John was recording from Melbourne at home, where he was also a little bit sick, not COVID, but he was uh, feeling a little bit sick. So he was coughing a, a little bit, which he worried about, but I don't think people will care because the substance of the conversation is more important than any of that. Oh yeah, his coughing, um, if we don't edit it out, it is not disruptive to the conversation at all. Um, and you know, what it, what a uh, joy it must be to have access to a mind like Hattie because it comes with so, so, so much knowledge. I mean. One of the things about listening to him is that any question you posed to him uh, across the educational landscape, because he's got so much data uh, at his fingertips and he's just so immersed in this world, he can bring a, a perspective to it so quickly. Um, that's just so helpful for you to, or me as a listener, just to Get, get some context and really maybe think about what seemed like a simple, discreet thing in this in this different way. So um, I, I know listeners, you must, most of them know who Hattie is. He's just, he, he's almost a household name, especially for educators. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, it, it won't disappoint. And I like that this book is not um, a second edition. He really goes into why it's a, it's, it's a, a sequel or, a, or or an extension of the work that he's done with the first book. Um, and I think he's had, he has some really great insights to share about what's coming up in this new text. It's always on my mind when I think about his research, mm -hmm. um, not just from the effect size piece, because I think that's what people gravitate to, mm -hmm. but also just from the, well, this is how it's looked so far, and this is how impactful it's been. But if we can do things a little bit diff differently where this is concerned, then maybe the impact will be greater or just the idea of, you know, being more intentional about understanding that we need to be able to focus on learning. And then you go into so many situations where people are focusing on the adults or on tasks that they need to be able to do. And when you bring it back to student learning, which is what mm -hmm. John always does, that's really important. And I agree with you when it comes to the sequel. I remember it was years ago, I was running a workshop in Wisconsin and uh, one of the first things I asked is, what do you know about John Hattie's research? And there were a few people that actually said, well, his research is very dated. It's mm. from the 1970s and 1980s. And, you know, the book came out in 2009. It's seven years later or something like that. And I, I said, OK, thanks. That's really interesting because John actually updates his research more than anybody that I know. And he talks about that within this recording, which is important because I think people will look at the sequel and say, oh, good, he's updated some research since 2019, but they need to know he's always done that. And in fact, I would say since that time, not only has he updated his research based on other meta-analysis that came in, but he's also updated his research based on feedback 
that he's received from people. The sequel is more than just a continuation of a research. It's also those situations that he was in where people were giving him feedback that he was mm -hmm. deeply listening to and that he would consider that as he as he moved forward. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is what we should expect from scholars. Things don't stay the same. Things are supposed to evolve and change. And so if there's any idea that scholars, once they figure something out, they know it and they're done, that's yeah. actually the problematic way of, of, of thinking and doing the work. Yeah. So um, yeah. without just further ado. Say, happy listening because uh, I could talk about John for hours at a time. So happy listening. I hope they find the recording, the, the conversation to be um, as amazing as I always do. Oh, they will. So um, without further ado, listeners, we bring you John Hattie and Peter, and we will see you on the other side. John Hattie, welcome to the Leaders Coaching Leaders podcast. It's good to be back, Peter. It's it's good to see you and and good to talk to you. Thank you, um, thank you for coming on. I want to say congratulations because the Visible Learning sequel has come out. So talk to us a little bit about first why did you decide to write a sequel after all these years? Peter, it's got nothing to do with Star Wars. <laughs> it's to do with that the pressure I had on me was to write a second edition. And in the second edition, it's kind of updating the 2008 book. And you know, things have changed dramatically since 2008 for me. Uh, for example, there were 800 meta-analyses in 2008. There's now 2,100 um, as of uh, 2022. I wanted to spend a lot more time on the story mm -hmm. rather than on the data. Um, as you know, Peter, because you've been intrinsically involved in this, we've done a lot of work since 2008 in schools, 10 to 15,000 schools, two or 300,000 teachers. We've learned a lot from that. And so you can see that there's a whole lot of things I've I've learned since I said, like, I don't want to call it a second edition because the expectation is it will be the old book updated. Mm -hmm. But I do want to base it on the old book, hence the notion of a sequel. But Peter, you can be assured there will be no prequel. Um, <laughs> it's okay. And so that was the, the main reason is to spend a lot more time on the story. Like there's 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 no references to the meta-analysis in the new book. Uh, there's not as much data in this, the new book. Um, the barometer has changed primarily because with 350 influences, that's another 108 pages. Uh, there's another 200 pages of references. Um, if I put all the data in, it would be another 400 pages. It's thick enough as it is. So all those details critical as they are we've put on the web as a free website called MetaX, so you could follow up all that detail so the book is much more about the story and it's about where i am in my thinking about that story um, that underlines those influences are most successful the other thing peter is about five years ago we, we ditched the lead table the list of influences mm -hmm. it was too often misinterpreted um like it worked for a while it got attention but then it was misinterpreted so we, we've ditched that uh, and trying to spend a lot more time on that explanatory story. You know, to me, it's always been interesting because I've, I mean, I've worked with you over the years and I remember I was presenting somewhere and they said, well, you know, he uses a lot of older data and stuff. And I'm like, but John's research is probably the most current research you could ever have because it's always being updated. And they didn't know that. So even though I see the sequel, and we talk about the increase in the number of meta-analysis and stuff. I've always known you to just be updating your research all the time. I feel like you just finally had time to breathe and actually do a sequel because you've been doing this work all along. It's not like, you know, 12 years later, 15 years later, you decided, hey, I'm now going to write a sequel. I think it's that research has always been there because you've always been keeping it so current. You just finally had the time to kind of put it down on paper. Would that make, does that make sense? It did. And actually COVID helped. Like I retired from my university job before COVID. COVID came along and for the first time for eons of my life, I had concentrated time yeah. that I could sit down and write. So that helped dramatically get uh, through it. And, and, and yes, I have kept up to date on the meta-analysis. I still do. Every time they come out, I've got systems built in my um, computer systems to alert me to new meta-analyses. I add them to the database. MetaX, we update it once or twice a year. I was still doing that, even though the sequel came out. I stopped July 2022. I said, that's it. 
I'm going to write the book up to that date. Obviously, in the last year, there's been another hundred odd meta analyses came out. Um, so your research didn't stop in 2008. I noticed um, one of the Twitter comments about the new book recently is, oh, had he's changed his mind? And I want to go back to that person and say, do you still teach as you did 15 years ago? Yeah. Very, yeah. Uh, and, you know, when I when I hear you say you have systems in place in this computer, all of a sudden I just had this image of like in your basement. You and Janet have this like huge master computer that we should be looking at. You know, one of the things that you said early on when we first started this conversation is the idea of, um, you know, you've learned a lot. And I think that because you talk about learning so much and facilitate those conversations among others, I think it would be interesting for people to hear what have you learned actually over the past 15 years? Well, um, I think the, the there are many major messages there. Like there's a new chapter in the book on learning. It seems surprising now looking back in 2008 that that didn't figure as much despite the title. Uh, like the criticism is that you can't see learning. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not visible. And my argument is that's correct. That's why the book's called that because we want to try and make that learning more visible. That learning is always about something. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is really critical to the whole equation. And teachers actually don't cause learning. Mm -hmm. It's the kids that create the learning. And so trying to make that more clear, the concept of clarity, I underestimated that. And our colleagues, Doug and uh, Doug Fisher, Nancy Fry, really highlighted that for me. I have moved to my feedback work, not just looking at the feedback that's given, but also how it's received. Mm -hmm. uh, I've learned a lot about that. I've spent, pro probably spent, 2008, I did struggle with the effect size of teaching methods. And I probably spent more time worrying about that since. And it wasn't until I was spent a lot of time trying to understand some of the low effects, like the effects, low effect of problem-based inquiry discovery. It's very low effects. And I spent a lot of time going back through all those meta-analyses. And in fact, it was um, Philip Doey from Switzerland who um, brought to my attention one of their studies of problem-based learning in medical school, effect size in first year zero to negative, effect size in fourth year 0.4. And then it became pretty obvious what was going on, that if students don't have the content before they go into problem-based, it doesn't work. They're excluded. And so I've developed in the new book this notion of intentional alignment, that we have various levels of complexity of what we want to teach, the content, the relationships between the content and the transfer, and different teaching methods affect those outcomes. Now, here's the bad news, Peter. By age eight, most kids learn, despite what teachers say, what learning is about is knowing lots. Mm. And no matter what teachers say, it comes back to that. And I, and the argument I'm putting in the book is okay to be greedy. We can go for all levels, the knowing lots, the, the knowing how, the relationship between ideas, and the knowing with the transfer. The learning strategies differ depending on the level of complexity. The teaching methods differ. And so I, and once that model was developed, suddenly a lot of the teaching strategies made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. here's, the, here's, here's the weird thing. There are hardly any teaching methods that exist that cover all three levels of cognitive complexity. Now, Jigsaw is the only one. Maybe the Padiam notion that comes out of North Carolina is pretty close. The other thing that I find fascinating, Peter, is that there's virtually no research on the quality, the impact of lesson planning, of lesson plans. Mm -hmm. And that's there's a massive gap, particularly given the workload that teachers put into that. Right. So it's not what I've just learned. It's what I've learned that we don't know much about. Um, and then coming to the heart of what you do in your day life, how do you get this message across in schools about what the story is? Uh, every teacher who ever has been in the profession has a very strong theory of teaching. Um, I have a theory of teaching. Mine's not necessarily right or wrong. Um how do you actually have that conversation so it's not just someone listening to tips or tricks, but you're actually getting to that deeper understanding of what happens? And then the new book, I look at not only the mind frames of teachers and leaders and students and parents and, and climate and culture, but also underlying that is this notion of how we make evaluative decisions to do this rather than that. How we, how we, and I like the word evaluative because it puts the emphasis on value. How do we make those value decisions in the here and moment of the classroom to focus here rather than there? 
that's the essence of the expertise. So that's what a lot of the new book goes into. I think one of the one of the things that I always got from you over the years is that um, the research is important. Obviously, we know that you know effect sizes, all of that. But I think part of what I've learned from you is that the larger message is really to just let's talk about what teaching and learning looks like, right? Like to just have the conversation because too often I feel like people, especially maybe during COVID and after COVID, they they go in to teach, but they don't really take time to talk about what they're learning in the process. And And I feel like even when I'm working with districts, you know, districts are big on saying their principals need to be instructional leaders, but when you go to a district meeting, leaders are being talked at. And I feel like your work has always been about, let's have the conversation about what these things could look like. Would that be fair to say? Because I think if you wanna go into the weeds, you're, you're, the research can be very complicated, but I think the other side, the very practical side is to say, you know, can we at least take time to sit back and actually talk about teaching and learning and what's working and what's not within our schools. Would that be fair to say? Peter, we ask students to come to school. Actually, we don't ask them. We make it compulsory to come to school because we believe that our model of schooling, <coughs> excuse me, makes a difference to the students. Learning, love of learning, joy of learning, and learning about. I don't see why it's any different when we talk about teachers. Yeah. The same model we should apply. And we know that in classrooms, that balance between monologue and dialogue is pretty critical. We know that understanding how students are thinking, how they're processing, how they're appreciating classes and all that is absolutely critical. It's no different with adults. And you're right, so much professional learning, um, we sometimes don't know. Oops, sometimes we don't know why the teachers are in the room. They don't know why they're in the room. Oops. They have to be there. Yeah. I'm just watching. I, I thought my mute was on. Sorry. I've got a cold, Peter, so I'm... I know. I'm sorry. I feel like I call you at a bad time, but I'm thankful. It's mad flu. It's only a cold. <laughs> um, and so why the teachers are in the room, and sometimes we're not very good at diagnosis of understanding. Sometimes we don't appreciate that teachers have very strong theories of teaching. Yeah. And we just... Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> and we don't acknowledge that. Um, like, Peter, your work and Jenny Donahue's work on collective efficacy is very much based on listening to the perceptions, the views of the people in the room as opposed to talking to them. It's, it involves social sensitivity, that, that ability to demonstrate that you do understand what other people are saying. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that does not exist in professional learning. That would be wrong. But so often professional learning is, is seen as come and hear someone give a talk. And we know the effect size of that's extremely low. It's getting into that brain. It's getting into that understanding. It's hearing what your theory of teaching is, Peter. Like one of the things I think that teachers struggle with is evidencing their impact. Because to them, it's obvious. But unfortunately, it's not as obvious as they think it is. And one of the beauties of teachers is teachers are brilliant critics. And we can use that to its positive to say, how do we get other critics on whether that evidence is sufficient, whether it's powerful enough? And this is really getting to the heart of what you do and your collective efficacy. But you can. See, but my point being is, it does require a dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, in the same way it does in the classroom. And as many of my critics say, of course it's different when you're talking with five year olds and fifteen year olds and forty five year olds. I don't think it is that much. Yeah. I. I feel like when part of part of what's interesting to me is that. Do you think that teachers understand their theory of teaching? You, because oh, you said think, teachers yeah. have a theory of of teaching. Do, do you think? Do you think they under? Do you think they know what their theory of teaching is? Like I was talking to somebody today about self awareness and leadership, which is a topic that I'm deeply interested in right now, and how self-aware are you of your leadership styles? And I had a couple of principals today just say things like, I'm a transformational leader. I'm like, could you tell me more? And I felt like it was something they just kind of grabbed at and used the words, but they didn't have a deep sense of that. Do you think people 
Yeah, how they use the words. Their own teaching. I th you're right. They, they use certain words, and that can be misleading. But I think if you actually were spent time with that leader about you know how do you make the decisions, why do you focus on this rather than that, you know, how do you what's your concept of impact of the school, what's your narrative you want to have, they can wax lyrical about all that. Now to say it brings together in a developed theory may be a bit strong, but they do have very strong views about why they do rather this this rather than that. Um, and it's, it's like take for example. The concept of evidence. Now, some think that evidence is what they see in the classroom, but as Graham Nuttall has shown, they, they only they don't see eighty percent of what happens in the classroom. Right. Some of them think evidence is that kind of stuff that Hattie and DeWitt do when they write their books. Some think it's what is, is the outcome of student tests. Mm -hmm. Some thinks it's the artifacts of kids' work. And you know, my argument is it's all those. It's the triangulation of that. It's the way of checking that is what makes the difference. And so when you ask teachers and principals um, about why they do what they do, I, I think they can, they go on. Now, I don't think we do that often enough. We don't acknowledge their theories of now. Here's the hard part. Often when you I ask you, Peter, to, to tell me about your theory of teaching, I'm asking you to defend it. Mm. And that puts you in a position where you think, oh, wait a moment. But if you actually follow through teachers, like you do a lot of coaching work, you have to find out very quickly what the other person's theory of teaching is. Mm -hmm. They may not articulate it. Now, you're right. They sometimes grab certain words like transformation, instructional, and, and tie onto it, and that's okay -ish, but that's not what I'm talking about. And I do think that the, the greatest, one of the signs of respect and professional learning is acknowledging mm -hmm. that the people in front of you, walk to, they don't walk into the room with nothing. Right. They aren't black students. They do have theories of teaching, and we should be more aware of that, particularly if you want to influence and have a, a way of improving what they're doing, you're going to have to understand that. Yeah, and I mean, one of the areas that you helped me in, and you probably don't know you helped me in, is because I, when I'm running a workshop, I was in coaching, I develop success criteria with the people that are in the room, because you've always said that when you develop success criteria with the kids, with the students, it's going to be much more powerful to the learning experience. So that's something that I do. One of the things so I keep thinking. Secret, there's a secret in there, Peter. Okay. You should rock, as you develop it with the students, but you don't walk into the room with a blank slate. No, no, no. I you definitely have, have I have my success criteria that I want to, you know, the content we're going to focus on, but I also bring in what they're, you know, what because they need you, as well. You want to hear how yeah. they're interpreting your success criteria. And if it's not coming across as you want it to do, you got to learn their language. Yes. And I'm also worried that sometimes they're there and they don't even know why, because that's happened as well. One of the things I, I was wondering about when 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 you talk. You know, it's pretty intense to to um, read your work, learn your research. Uh, you know, I there there's a lot of there are a lot of times that I'm thankful to have known you because I could ask you questions and those kind of things. And of course, I have the Finding Common Ground blog where I could you know write it out and all that stuff and process it. We have what we know about education right now is that when it comes to teachers, at least in the United States, well, I would say around the world too. In some places, we have a teacher shortage. So we've got people that are becoming emergency certified. We've got principals, you know, L LPI and NASSP did that study a few years ago to show 42% want to leave the profession. When we look at something like when you're talking about your research and diagnosis, and then we look at the other side where we've got schools that have emergency certified teachers or they're fast tracked in or there's a teacher shortage, do you, are you worried? at all about the gap in the knowledge that some teachers and leaders will have based on maybe their quick entrance into education? Let me deal with a footnote first. I'm not a fan of all these surveys asking, do you intend to leave the profession within the next five or 10 years? It has a correlation of 0 0.03 with actual behavior. I should and have I, known I you would have research behind this. <laughs> and I know that at the moment we're weaponizing the whole teaching force, talking about burnout and stress, and yeah. we forget that teachers and principals have amongst the highest coping strategies with burnout. So I'm not saying burnout and stress is something we shouldn't worry about. Yeah. But like the essence of my work, Peter, comes down to one thing. Everything comes back to expertise. Mm -hmm. And my worry in the current debate is that's out the window. 
Like here in Australia, um, yeah, post COVID, the Morgan poll showed that the top four professions that are esteemed in Australia are doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and teachers. Mm. When you ask teachers, are they esteemed by the public? Only 40% say they're esteemed by the public. It's 90% plus. Now we're losing that with our current weaponization of, of stress and burnout, but the profession itself isn't very good at acknowledging expertise. Like you look at the structure of the teaching profession, the only way you get paid more is to take our best teachers out of the classroom and make them leaders. And that's wonderful on one hand, but it's sending a very bad message on the other. Um, the salary structure is based on experience, not on expertise. Our current ways of reducing the teacher education requirement to come into teaching is based on we can give you experience. That expertise, which is the core of all my work, I want, if anything else in this world, my influence, I hope, is he reintroduced the word expertise mm -hmm. because it is not a trivial exercise to get in front of a group of kids. Like Nearly every parent in the world during COVID realised that teachers don't just babysit. They don't just motivate. I remember this one parent saying to me, I watched my child during COVID learning and I didn't realise what such a horrible kid he was in the classroom. We do have some of those kids. Yeah. Uh, they are tough. Yeah. Um, and the fact that we have incredible expertise and I know we had a minister a few years ago who said all those kids that are violent in schools, we should get them out. He got a deputation of principals and teachers coming to him and saying, Minister knows the very kids we need to keep in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an incredibly powerful message. And I, yes, you got me on my, my worry here. I think that our current debates, where our profession is weaponizing its own worries about burnout and stress, not denying that that, that we do have a lot of workload and. <laughs> You know about getting teachers to de-implement things is not easy. Um, but the profession itself isn't very good at esteeming its expertise. Like you go to any workshop and and I have this classic question I ask. Take Rial. He struggles in class. But today he was got into the task. He really enjoyed it. He handed in the work. It was looking pretty good. And then I asked the audience to say, why was Rial successful? And I've done this probably hundreds of times in the, around the world, Peter. And I get, Raoul was interested. Raoul had a good breakfast. Raoul was committed. It was on topic. No one ever says. The teacher did it. Mm -hmm. It was the teacher that did it. Yeah. And so it's that whole notion. Now, let me be fair. We have bashed teachers up a long time. Yeah. And it doesn't take much for teachers to feel the brunt of criticism. But, you know, I, and I, I may be Pollyanna here, but all my work says no. What teachers are very good, they are brilliant change agents. They're brilliant at improving. They are a profession that's deeply embedded in expertise. And I struggle to understand why it's so resisted, both by the teaching profession and in our community. So, yeah, I am deeply worried that the more we personify teaching and leadership as all you need is a warm body, we're in deep trouble. And our kids are in deep trouble. Um and, and the other side of that, which does also get me perturbed, Peter, is you know, my background is in measurement and statistics. It's not, it's, just, it's not in the visible learning. And so all the analysis that I do from the measurement side says, in your country, we have 60% plus of teachers who are doing an incredible, stunning job. You never know that from the rhetoric. It's been a it has been an issue for for a very long time. I mean, it, lots of people ahead of me have have talked about it for sure. And you know, sometimes I think I think that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I know you will, but um, I feel like years ago you used to get criticism because they people thought that or accused you of picking on the teaching profession. When I actually think. Well, you, and I always felt this way. What you're doing is the opposite. You're actually elevating the profession, but you're also um, championing teachers. Is am I wrong about that, or or am I correct? Yeah, I was asked actually last year by a, a senator in um, Parliament about why I disparage teachers so much, and and my answer is. What I found is that the, the the biggest source of variance is not between schools. It's within a school. Mm -hmm. And by saying that, Peter, I'm acknowledging that we do have variability amongst our teachers on their impact. Yeah. So I've got a perfect critic's delight here 
they could pick up and say, oh, we're saying there's bad teachers out there that are not having the same effect as good teachers, and I am saying that. Yeah. But I am driven by the fact that the majority of our profession are very good, and I'm interested, and the whole basis of visible learning is what's the common features and denominators about those that have that kind of impact on students compared that don't have an above-average effect on students. So there is variability out there. So, yes, I'm an equal opportunity um, person to be criticised here. For those who want to say he's talking about bad teachers, yeah, I am. I'm talking about good teachers. Yes, I am. But fundamentally, what keeps me going is as I travel the world, I see so much excellence. Mm -hmm. It is so impressive to see so much excellence in our system. And my fascination as an academic is why are we not finding that excellence and scaling it up? What we tend to do instead is we look around for problems and we try and fix them. Now, I know why. Fun funding follows problems. It doesn't follow success. Right. I know that you can get an angst. Like every time there's an angst going on in, in this country at the moment, you can either see the teachers to blame or the teacher's going to fix it. Yeah. It's an easy argument. Um, it's much easier to argue that you have massive disparities in your school than you have massive success. And it's 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 just part of the human nature of how our contingencies work. But our, my fear is that unless the profession takes on a major responsibility for esteeming its excellence, we are in difficulties. Well, I know I know that you're one of the people that I surround myself with that I always know that you're going to tell me exactly what you're thinking. I'm never worried about that. And I, I do. I appreciate that because I I feel like it's just a good barometer to have. One of the last questions I wanted to be able to ask you is, you know, because you talked about how you got rid of the table because people were using it incorrectly. And we've talked a little bit about kind of surface level understanding of things. What role does confirmation bias play? Do you have any examples maybe, or what role confirmation bias plays in how people view your research? Like, I feel like when, when the ranking used to be out, people would look and say, oh, well, we do that already. We do that already. We do that already but they could just be confirming their own biases without knowing that they're really, whether they're doing that impactfully or not. Does that question make sense? Like what role does confirmation bias play in your research or how people perceive your research and what should they do about it? Personally, in my own teaching, Peter, I am brilliant at confirmation bias. <laughs> I ask the question of my students, one of them answers, and I say, oh, they all understand. <laughs> they walk out of class with a smile on their face, and I say, oh, they like that. They're just relieved to get out. Yeah. And so, and, and one of the arguments that I, I take throughout the work is that we actually should be doing the opposite. We should be asking, what evidence would I accept that I'm wrong? Mm -hmm. uh, now, I've talked to you about this personally, but I'm very... Uh, driven by Karl Popper's work from Philosopher of Science. I've quite quite a bit of his work in the new book uh, where he argued that science progresses by asking for evidence that you're wrong, looking for refutation. And I argue that um, that should be valued in classrooms. Like take, take, for example, when a kid makes a mistake. In many classrooms, that's an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. That's a point of failure. It should be a point and opportunity to learn. Yeah. And we look at the classroom climate, and so many classroom climates don't allow kids to fail. And that's just a travesty. And so looking for evidence that you're wrong. Um, and so one of the things we say is that when you walk into a classroom, you know, look, three impact questions. You, What did you have impact on? And what did you not have impact about? Mm -hmm. Who did you have impact on? And who did you not have impact on? And to what degree was the magnitude? And all of those ask both those questions, the confirmation what worked and the confirmation what didn't work and that what leads and that's what great teachers do peter is they're looking for that evidence like janet clinton my, my partner my wife who's an evaluator she calls it nosiness the essence of evaluative thinking is being nosy yeah. and i bet you know lots of teachers who are incredibly nosy some principals are incredibly nosy they want to know what's going on they want to say peter in your class what's going on now can i come in and see can i be nosy and actually see if that's happening. Can I give you another interpretation of your class? And they want to do it together with the, with the absolute essence they want to improve. They don't want to beat you up. They don't want to make you accountable in the negative sense. They want to work with you. And that skill of being nosy is the essence, I would argue, against confirmation bias. But coming to your question, of course, when people read my book, they go in with a theory of 
how they think about their world. Of course, when they read things like it doesn't matter what the subject is, it doesn't matter who your kids are, it doesn't matter what country you are, they get very upset. They get upset when their favourite techniques don't come up the top of the chart yeah. and they forget. My work is about probabilities. If you do these things, here's a probability. It doesn't mean to say you do it good or badly. And like take for another reason we got rid of the chart. People say, oh, I did all the stuff at the top. Yeah, but they did it very badly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. And so, yeah, confirmation bias, very strong, but I want you to have the opposite. I really want you to say, my job here is to find out what I can get better at. Yeah. Well, John, I could talk to you all evening um, or morning for you, depending, but I know that uh, you're also not feeling well, but I just want to thank you for everything. You've been a mentor of mine for years and and uh, just really important mentor. Um, but thank you for being on the Leaders Coaching Leaders podcast and congratulations on the sequel. Thanks very much, Peter. All right, where do I begin? So much stuff coming out of John Hattie. You know, we had a prior conversation with another guest and you have been talking about the interconnectedness of some of our sessions and how they're building upon each other, even though they're not happening at the same time. Um, and, and, and Hattie was also, I think, underscoring this idea that, you know, it's important to be clear about what it is that we spend our time on and, and what it is that we're doing. But I also like that he talked about in this new sequel, um, that he's focusing a lot on what people don't know much about yet. Like there's this appreciation that there are still these topics such as lesson planning that are ubiquitous in education, but have we really taken the time to figure out, do they work? How do they work? When they work, what's going on about them? He is like an educational surgeon in his, in his desire to be so precise yeah. about this is actually the move you want to make because it really is about getting the most bang for your buck again because children have one year with mm -hmm. you to get what they need from you and his commitment to wanting to get that right is always so um is always so inspiring and i think um i think he also had a lot of interesting thing i'm sorry i'm just looking because i took so many notes there's so many Here's something that I think hopefully will be um, inspiring for, for the audience too, is that there's so much talk always about what is wrong with teachers and leaders and educators mm -hmm. and they're leaving the field and it's just doomsday in a dystopian society you can really feel like that. And he said, you know, teachers and leaders have some of the highest coping strategies in all professions, which makes all the sense in the world considering what... <laughs> what educators do. And so I thought it was really great that he was able to surface the level of resilience that the, the people who get into this field have and continue to have, and that we, we might not give them enough credit um, outwardly about just how good they are and how set they are to do this job really well, even if there is still room for improvement and things that need to change. Yeah, that was a part of the conversation that I was happy to get into because yeah. I have I focused on the anxiety and stress piece, um, you know, because it's been just such a it's it's been a huge topic to focus on where people leave in the profession and all that stuff. And I also I remember um, you know, in the early days when I first started to work with him on Twitter, there were people that came at me with some negative comments about John and that he was teacher bashing. And that's not what he's doing. And mm -hmm. it's sad to me that somebody wants to focus on, there are times people want to focus on how to become more impactful. Mm -hmm. People will look at that and say, well, we're teacher bashing. No, we're, we're actually not. We're, we're, we're talking about in our profession. I mean, I know that speaking for myself, I always want to get better at what I'm doing. I want to be more impactful. I want to be more intentional. And that's really what John is talking about. And he, to me, about the interconnectedness between all of our recordings this, this year, um, he his research is really the overarching, mm -hmm. right? And then everybody that we're talking to, those are the nuances um, within all of that research. And then John also adds in his nuances as well. And you know, we're talking hundreds of influences on learning and he really does know each one of those intimately. Um, and it is fascinating to talk to him because I think if you're really listening, 
he can help change your mindset mm -hmm. of certain things that you might be focusing on. And I, that's also why one of the questions I had for him was you know, like, overall, what do you want people to know about your work? What do you want them to walk away with? Because what I want to walk away with is just, a, is what I'm doing really working? Yeah. If it's not, I have a lot of places that I can go to actually help make sure that it's more impactful. Um, and that's what I think is research can help as well. Yeah. Time is a limited resource. I think we all want to use it to the best of our ability. Um, and so we need the kind of information that Hattie brings to make decisions about what we do with that time. Yeah. So, so well, I hope that people enjoyed that interview as much as I did. I know I probably say that at the closing of all of our podcast recording, but um, I do, Tanya, I feel really fortunate to just get in the space where I can just ask questions and learn from people who bring a lot to the table, regardless of their background. And this, you know, in this season, we focused a lot on on just different things, implementation, equity, you know, race. We've talked about um, uh, gender in education and just there have been some, some fantastic conversations that we've had and John certainly always adds to that piece as well. So I'm hoping that if people really enjoyed the podcast that they can, you know, give us some feedback on that. What did they like about it? What do they think we need to improve on? Who do we, you know, maybe there's somebody you think we should be interviewing. I get emails quite often about, um, you know, would you be interested in interviewing these people? And we know that there are a lot of interesting people to talk about. So giving us feedback like that is really cool too. Yeah, listeners, we are going to be revving up for the season six soon because that's just how it, it happens. <laughs> Little break in between. <laughs> But um, yeah, this information will be um, immensely helpful to us. And, and going back to you talking about this season, it, there's a reason we've said it after every session. We've, we, we really do try to bring listeners the best mm -hmm. um, and the most relevant topics. And um, uh, we think we've really done a great job this season. And we hope that you agree and hope you've gotten a lot out of it. So everyone, thank you so much for listening. Peter, I think at this point I can say, see you next season. <laughs> <laughs> Tanya, it is always an honor to work on these with you. And yes, thank you to everybody that, that have been listening. But um, All right. we really appreciate it. All right, everyone enjoy your day. Take care. <laughs>